1989, right after earning his PhD from UCLA. For two years, from 2003 to 2005, he served as director of the Office of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts. His essays, commentaries, and reviews have appeared in too many journals and outlets to mention, but I will mention one, and that's the Martin Center. Uh, we've published several pieces by, by Mark over the years. His books include Literary Criticism and Autopsy, The Pragmatic Mind, Explorations in the Psychology of Belief, and The Dumbest Generation, How the, Dig How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. And I was lucky enough to be in the audience when the Martin Center, which was the Pope Center then, uh, brought Mark to UNC to talk about that book. Um, an audience that in, at that time, all of those students were millennials. Uh, they're not anymore, but uh, that, was a, that was a great talk, and we're glad to have Mark back today. Uh, today, he's going to tell us about his latest book, The Dumbest Generation Grows Up, from stupefied youth to dangerous adults. So please help me welcome Mark Bauer. <laughs> It's great to be here and, and to be with the, the Martin Center people whom I've worked with for several years. And I want to say a word uh, about the Martin Center because uh, what we've seen in America in, with this woke revolution that has been a tidal wave or a tornado, a hurricane in the last few years uh, has as its premises ideas that were percolated, so you can use it, but were created in, in humanities departments, for the most part, uh, in, in roughly they, they, they came to fruition in the late 1980s and the early 90s. Queer theory came along in the late 80s. The critical race theory was, it began to be conceived during those same years. It happened in English departments. You know, who would have thought? And at the time, people would say, who cares, really? I mean, like these academic English professors or whatever they are, the women's studies press, they do their own thing. I mean, we don't really need to pay attention to them. We can focus on law and economics on, on the rights, and we can, we can go about getting the right people elected. And what we now know is, that a lot of those people who got their degrees in those humanities departments in the 90s, they're now high up. They were high up in the Obama administration. They were high up, and they're high up in the Democratic Party. Now, what it shows is that academia really matters. These humanities departments really, really matter. They have a long time effect. The Martin Center was way on this, the Pope Center, early on about the importance of what, what goes on. In the, the change in the syllabus of the English department is, is, is like a, you know, a pebble in the pond. It, it ripples outward. It takes time. It evolves over the years. But these are people now who are setting DEI policies. They're in human resources, <clears throat> creating these effectively loyalty votes in order to get hired. They control more and more of the pipeline into the, into the elite, which has more and more surveillance all the time, more tests of where you stand on, on this and that. So the work of the Martin Center, I, I think, has the past work of the Martin Center has become I'm ever more clear how important that was. And we know now how much of the battle in America, this culture war going on today, really is uh, one of the hotbeds, one of the theaters of conflict, is, is higher education. And that one has to do things like this, this diversity uh, bill, this model legislation. I got to speak to Stanley Kurtz on the phone the other day. I had a podcast with him uh, that just came out. I do podcasts in person a couple times a week at the magazine. Uh, this is very, very important, right? Because we know <coughs> policy is personnel. Personnel is policy. 
The left knows if we get our people in office, we don't have to argue. We don't have to create, you know, lay out policies. We, we just we got the right people who will do the right thing. And they were very good at this. I mean, I saw in higher education, the left just ran circles around moderate liberals and those few conservatives. They were so good at taking over the administrative side of, of things. So I, I salute the Martin Center. It's an honor to, to speak uh, at, at their at their event. And to you, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for supporting the Martin Center's work. Now, uh, the books, the books, The Dumbest Generation, 2008. I did that book. The thesis there was these millennials, 15 years old, they were hailed as the next great generation. Uh, 60 Minutes did a, did a, a piece on millennials. Uh, called The Millennials Are Coming. Uh, as if they were really a millennial advent. They're gonna transform the workplace. They're gonna transform con uh, consumption, selling, and marketing, shopping. Uh, they, they're gonna change social ads because they're the digital natives. They're the early adopters of these tools. They were way ahead of the boomers who'd have to you know, buy one of these handhelds and it was called, say, here, son, can, can you fix, get this thing going for me? And this was, to say they are gonna lead America into the 21st century, the millennials. The millennials are coming, and they're so progressive, too. They, they elected our first African-American president. They have that historic tolerance. They are more tolerant, more well-meaning than any generation in human history. Just ask them. And, and so, uh, they'll tell you that they were very, very boastful about this. And all, all, my, all the mentors at the time we were you know, pushing the, the teachers who were saying, you know, I really learn more from my students than they learn from me. Uh, that that child-centered uh, attitude about things. You know, my response was, then why are you collecting a paycheck then? You, know, you, you, should, you, should, you should be removed. Um, but, so I wrote that, that book. You know, The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardize Their Future, or Don't Trust Anyone Under 30. Uh, that, that was, that was the, the joke in, in the subtitle. I had a USA Today reporter, she's about 24. Uh, call me and interview me, and she said, do you really think you can't trust anyone under 30? I said, it's a joke. <laughs> there was this slow, before you were born. Uh, it's the opposite. You know, you, ever, you, you know the, the Who song, talking about my generation? You know, the line, hope I die before I get old? Uh, let's ask Roger Daltrey if he still thinks that. Right? Uh, uh, today, he, he's 75 or something. But, um, so I did that book, saying this is awful. For these, these kids to have these kids. It's horrible for a 15 year old to walk around with 250 photos right here, you know, in, in, in the pocket at all times. It's terrible to send 3,000 text messages a month, which they were doing by, by 2010. They are being enveloped in this adolescent culture all the time. They're going in their bedroom, shutting the door, getting all the screens going. They got the TV show still going, the music playing. They've got, they got the game uh, happening, and texting, photos going back and forth. And this was an adolescent reality, reinforced. They could shut out the grown up world in a way we couldn't, right? We couldn't do this. I had to sit and listen to my parents with, you know, some guy named Walter was talking about Watergate, you know, every night on CBS <laughs> News. And I, there was only one screen in the house. There's only one phone. It was on the wall in the kitchen. You had to go like this seven times. There were only five TV stations telling millennials this. I said, you poor thing, what an impoverished existence you, you, you must have had. So uh, I couldn't shut it out. They could. They could. Now, think about you're 15 years old. You, you, you go in, you, you got your Facebook page in 2008. You, you got your big friends list and you're building that. <clears throat> And you, you've got your favorite websites, the information coming in, you can control all that, right? You can control reality for yourself. It was called at the time, the daily me, right? You can make your world reflect your, your 15 year old ego, right? And what if, you, what, if, what if a website that you look at, maybe some news thing, has an article that you don't like, what do you do? You block the website, you just turn it off. What if 
On Facebook, someone says something you don't like. Unfriend. They were canceling when they were 15. The cancel culture we see today, that they lead the way on, they've been canceling all their lives with just a push of a button. They, they could remove from their world anything they didn't like, anything that didn't affirm them. Just get, get, shut them out. They don't exist. You, know, you disappear them. <laughs> so uh, what they're doing now in the public sphere when they sign a petition with 2,000 others, happy to do so, to get a stranger fired for telling a dumb joke, you know, a sexist joke, they'll do that because, well, yeah, that's what you do. That's what makes life better. They're quite righteous about the cancel culture that they are functioning in. I didn't think of that in 2008, that that's what would happen. But what they've done, why I write this new book, The Dumbest Generation Grows Up. Okay? From stupefied youth to dangerous adults. That's the subtitle. Okay? From dumb adolescents, and all adolescents are dumb. And I was a dumb 17 year old. I knew it all, of course. But I, I, you know, I didn't know anything. Um, but they've now become dangerously illiberal, small L, anti democratic. Okay, that orange-haired monster who won in November 2016? No! No, 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 stop, stop, resist! That's anti-democratic. What you gotta do is you take the results of that election and then you organize. You work through democratic channels. And you win next time. You know, do you think you get to win every single time? Well, yes, we're the good people. We're the good ones, we care. We, we should win every single time. We never lose. Everyone gets a participation trophy. Right? <laughs> so this has been the conditioning that has produced the 30-year-old who, by the way, is bitter. There's a sour mood among millennials today. They're disappointed. Life was so good in that bedroom at age 15. It was so much fun. I could do it all night. Right? And now, 33, life isn't that good anymore. I don't have the perfect job. Job dissatisfaction, very high among the millennials. Uh, I'm depressed a lot. High rates of anxiety. Go, go ask the psychological counselors on college campuses. The, the meetings are going up all the time. High rates of narcissism. Remember, narcissists are not happy people. They need constant reinforcement. Right? Whoever would have thought that they would be narcissists and we gave them a tool where they can photograph a meal on their plate 10 seconds before they eat. Right? Uh, or, you, know, you give them YouTube, whose original slogan was broadcast yourself. It's all about me. That, that daily me. Of course it's going to produce narcissistic adults. Um, they also have a vindictive sense of, of life. And this is self-reported in, in, in the survey that I quote in, in this book. If they see some injustice being done, or someone that does something to, to them, they want to see retribution. They want punishment, even a microaggression. Microscopic aggression. You, they're going to pay. We want to make you pay for that, uh, they're also not forming families, getting married to form families at nearly the rate of boomers did. At age, by age 40, one third of millennial men will never have been married. It's a very large rate. A population can't, re, can't continue. You know, the birth rate will, for, for existing Americans, it's gone down. The immigration and the longer lifespans have hidden that fact. But not forming families, that's a sign of pessimism about the future, right? I'm not building anything. I'm not gonna sacrifice for someone else, because that's what children mean. Uh, so they're not doing so well. Now, the second part, I'm gonna wrap this up, because we'll have, we'll have a nice discussion. But 
A lot of these are just adolescent impulses that we all had at that age. Okay? They had tools to extend, okay, to empower those impulses like never before. Now, what curbed the adolescence was a humanistic education. Right? Reading a lot of novels, listening to great music, watching good movies, learning about what happened at Shiloh and Gettysburg and the French Revolution. These are things that give you a more realistic sense of life. That everything isn't always perfect. You know, you, you read about the French Revolution and you learn, you know, Robespierre was a highly moral individual. He was ferociously incorruptible. That's what he's called, I call evil. People who believe that they are very good, people who believe that they are pure, acting out of pure motives, can often end up doing very bad things. That's a lesson that the millennials didn't learn. They didn't read George Orwell and Friedrich Hayek on the way in which revolutionary impulses can produce a whole new form of authoritarianism. They didn't read great love stories of rejection, Dido and Aeneas, right? Odysseus and Calypso, all the way up, you know, Gatsby and Daisy. I would give them a little <coughs> clearer sense of the often tragic side of love and romance. They didn't get those things because the mentors didn't give it to them. They eliminated Western Civ requirements in general education. If you went to Stanford in 1960, I lay out this in, in the book, I went back to Stanford and look at old catalogs. Uh, 1960, your, your freshman year was largely mapped out for you. You had three courses in Western Civ. Stanford was on a quarter system. Three courses in Western Civ, three courses in English, writing and literature. Great literature. Now, what did that tell them? You're coming to campus and you are stepping into a monumental inheritance. Right? The past is filled with greatness, sublimity, beauty, genius, masterpieces. You're going to look at threshold events like Waterloo. Right? You're going to look at, look at the, the Spanish Armada. Right? Great changes in history. You're going to feel like I, I live in the shadow right, of great and powerful things. They don't get that at all now in college. I went, you know, Betsy Fox, Jim Daisy, Harvey Claire, and I went to the dean about 15 years ago, post a great books program. The dean said, well, if you can get funny, that, that's kind of good, but can you change the name from great books? Greatness, bad, it's a bad word. In higher ed, greatness is a bad word. That's what the 19-year-olds actually are thirsty for. Okay? They're dying to have deep purpose and meaning in their lives. And we're not going to talk even we're not going to talk about religion and how, how, how our secular society has killed religion in their lives so much that a lot of them are nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns. They might have some vague spiritual beliefs. But they have, they don't practice religion in any concrete way. They don't pray, you know, whatever. They have no transcendent orientation in, in their lives. These things are equipment. I'm just thinking about pragmatically. These things are equipment for managing the ordinary disappointments of adulthood. We all get dumped. <laughs> okay. You know? It happens. <laughs> We all get betrayed in some way. We all don't get that job that, 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 that we wanted. We <coughs> cheated. Okay. If you've got this background of novels, right? novels actually teach you a lot of psychology. When you, when you read a novel, you've got to think about the motives 
of characters, a lot of characters whom you despise. But you can't read the novel without saying, well, what's, what's, what's going on with that person? And this is actually reflected neurologically. When Anna Karenina, I, I cite this study, when Anna Karenina jumps on, in front of the train, kills herself, if you're reading that, a little part of your brain that operates motor function of your legs lights up. When you read the novels, you do have a vicarious experience, literally, not metaphorically. It's actually literally your brain is, is doing this. Okay? So that, that's why the reading is so important. Reading novels are very good psychology in that discernment of, of motive. They didn't get this. They were online all the time, and the mentors failed them. Right? The first line in this new book is, what have we done to them? We've raised a generation without transcendence, without greatness, without a noble past. Only one third of them consider themselves patriots. Okay. It's not a good feeling to feel shame, ashamed of your own home. Patriotism gives you gratitude. That's a good feeling. It's affirming. They don't have that. So we've left them without the equipment. We gave them these tools. They dove into youth world, and we didn't give them, again, the things that counteract the juvenility, right? the adolescence. And this is where we are, an angry generation. And I worry, stop now, I worry Gen Z is not going to be better not going to be better off. So, but oh, you know, I always bring books. I, I bring them and I, I sell them for like half price, my, my cost. If people want me to sign uh, other books, tell this generation, I'll be here, I'll, I'll talk to people afterwards, happy to, uh, happy to, uh, happy to do that for you. Uh, they're, they're all on the table there. That said, uh, we can have discussion. Yes. Questions? What's the trigger for them becoming adults. I know mine was getting my first paycheck and 30% of it was gone, but a lot of these kids, don't, <laughs> they don't pay taxes. So there's no reality. Well, they shouldn't have to pay taxes, should they? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is, this is the, the wake up call. Yeah, paying taxes, looking at that paycheck and saying, what's this, this FICA thing, right? You know? <laughs> By the way, you guys aren't having kids. You're not gonna get any FICA when you're 70. You know, just, just to let you know, <laughs> there aren't going to be people, enough people to support you. But I just want to say my thanks. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be getting Social Security in a few years. But uh, thank you. But a lot of them, yeah, yeah. Just the economic realities of working, looking at that paycheck, having to pay taxes, having to pay bills, right? Big wake up call. Another wake up call. But, having but, but kids. A, lot, a lot of them don't pay taxes. That's right. That's right. That's right. We, we, you know, we, we have so many, uh, right, so, so many soft landings for, for them. The, the hard knocks, we, we cushion the hard knocks for them. And we think that it's unjust. Why should they ever have to suffer any hard knocks? Why, you know? I mean, in that, in that digital universe they fabricated, they got rid of all the hard knocks. Why can't, why can't they do it? You know, they transfer, remember they were in their bedrooms for years, for hours every day, okay? During the formation of their civic sense, right? This is when they start realizing what the bigger world is like, what the bigger society is like. And they did it in, again, this artificial reality. So yeah, the, the economic realities don't, don't, don't hit them so much and we shield them from that. I would also say having kids, right? I didn't grow up until I had a son. And it was, it, it, it's, been, it's been one humiliation for me. <laughs> uh, he, he's now 6'5", he's now he literally can look down on his father. <laughs> uh, so, and you know, you can't, you can't fight him. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I learned. Uh, you know, the passive resistance is very hard to, it works for the parent. But having kids, because, you know, I gotta get on that airplane at nine son is coughing. I gotta stay up for the moment. You know, you just do it. I don't count. That that's a healthy form of, of maturity. Another thing that can encourage 
maturation is isolation, solitude. Right? Okay, I'm out in the world now. I can't be with my friends all the time. I gotta work, I got some crummy single apartment I have to go home to. That solitude is, is part of growing up. You know, one of the things that you do when you grow up is you learn how to be alone. You learn, you learn how to deal with loneliness. You know? Early adults, it would be a very lonely time. You're not in high school and college anymore. You don't have all the, your friends around you. Now they do. They have their friends with them all the time right here. Mark Zuck, it was either Mark Zuckerberg or Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, I can't remember which one, said, we're trying to make it so that you never, ever need to be alone. Okay? You never need to be lonely. You have to be alone. You gotta be lonely sometimes. That's gonna make you more human, a, a more, uh, a more empathetic creature. And by empathy, I don't mean sympathy. You know, one of the things cognitive empathy is very important to develop. Cognitive empathy is when you're able to imagine what another person is experiencing. You, you're, you're able to figure what is going on inside that person's head, even if you despise that person. Okay. That's what I said about the novels being, being good psychology. Cognitive empathy is when you look, not people just as surface phenomena, but you, you, you go deeper inside. And that's, that's one of the things that the, the novel reading teaches you to do. They don't do that. They hear something, they don't, that's racist. That's sexist, right? That's such a superficial way of looking at people. Be alone for a while. Think about your solitude. Undergo the experience of isolation. Look into yourself and maybe inspire you to look a little more into others and don't broadcast yourself all, all the time. Spend some time in rituals of isolation. Yes, ma'am. So much of this resonates because I've got a 30-year-old, a 28-year-old, a 25-year-old. I feel like you described them in some form. Anyway, uh, forming families, uh, to me, it's like they think their pets are their kids. And I'm like, you have no idea. No, like, stop. Not uncommon. Yeah, so, but here's the one that, what you said that. I mean, I love my dog. I do, too. I love mine, but, I, but it's not my kid. So, you know, I, I, I mean, they, they, they refer to their animals as, like, children. I don't yeah. know. Um, we, we know that my, my, my dog thinks he's the prince. He's <laughs> a poodle, standard poodle. He thinks he's Very the prince. Very cool dog. Yeah, yeah, and that, what, that, what that makes me, I'm yeah. intended. Okay. Uh, but there's something that strikes me that, that I find slightly terrifying. Um, this vindictive sense of life. Um, they want to punish and they want retribution. We obviously missed collectively teaching them just to be decent humans. And that, that's what that scares me. And I'm curious, what is it that, that is satisfying in them when they get retribution? Like, what need are they filling with that? You know, this, this woke thing, it's a merciless movement. It is un, no generosity, no forgiveness. No grace. With the woke. You know, boom, nail people. And you don't let them. You don't let them recover. We have these these you know, awful rituals of apology that, that take place. You, you know, the apology is almost worse than the, the original crime, you know, the sin. Um, but see, I think the vindictiveness comes from the fragility that they they feel. Uh, they. You know, if you if you are, and a lot of this comes from the most ambitious millennials, the ones who are trying to move up. I mean, we, we saw, remember the screaming kid at Yale on the quad? Yeah. Screaming at that professor, obscenities, and the professor, Nicholas Christakis, he's very calm and reasonable, and she, and the others around, complete meltdown. You're at Yale, you can write your ticket. Actually, that, that student is now in Columbia Law School. Okay, she, she's got full rides, fellowships. I mean, I, I looked her up the other day. Uh, life is very good for you, but here's the thing. It's extremely competitive, right? The high achiever millennial has gone through a system of scrupulous evaluation and filtering. 
getting to that top college, getting those AP courses, getting those grades, getting the high test scores, going to the good graduate schools, and in every step, people fall away. You know? About 21% 20, about of students going into college want to go into medicine. About three or four percent, if you get there. They go into an organic chemistry, and boy, they can't compete. You know, it's a filtering thing. So they, they are trying very hard, very competitive world, and it takes a psychological toll on them. It makes them deeply insecure. And I think that the, when they do the canceling, they do it in the name of a victim, right? That justifies everything, the victim. You have done a horrible thing to this person, this group, you're gonna pay. So it's really identification with a victim that they do. Now, they know they're not victims. You can't play the victim game if you're at Yale. Really, really, it really doesn't fly. But if you can find a victim, and then you can identify with that victim and then act, I think there's a psychic relief that goes with that process. You know, I, I, can, I can work off, again, that, 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 that energy, right? That troubling energy that is built up in me when I'm trying to get ahead and I'm worried about what's gonna happen and I, I may not make it, I may not get that school that, that I wanted to get into. I think that competitive, I, I said to students, you know, I started saying them in 2010, you don't, you don't think you're friends. The Emory, you know, high-powered students, they're all looking at graduate sources. Look at one another and say to yourselves, you're not my friend. You're my competitor. <laughs> I'll just kind of <laughs> So I think that there's some, again, it's a psycho, emotional, social thing that the canceling gives them a, it, it gives them a, a psychic relief with a moral justification. That's what you want. You want to feel, I'm doing something here, and I can feel moral about it, but really, what, what I can do is I can feel good. That's that's my analysis for what for what it's worth. So, yes, sir. And then and then in back. Yes, sir. You mentioned change in. I'll shorten my answers. Also. <laughs> you mentioned change in families and decline in the birth rate in the U.S. But it's, the fertility rate's been below the replacement level for many years now, not just in the U.S. but all over Europe, the West. all over high income Asia, yeah. Japan, China, etc. Oh. Do you have the same explanation for these other countries as you have for the U.S. This wokeness. I, I, I'm not sure about the conditions, say in Italy, because that goes way back quite a bit. I'm sure there were economic reasons about, about Italian family formation. So I, I, I hesitate to, to generalize beyond, beyond, beyond the US. Um, you know, the sexual revolution had a lot to do in the US, would you say? In this demographic transition, though, it's pretty general for the whole world. Yeah. Major change. Yeah. But not the, not the developing world, right? Uh, they're split. So all the high income countries have yeah. the birth rates you're talking about, the low income yeah. countries, the high ones, right? Yeah. That's what Malthus missed. Right? Yeah. 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 I wonder when the U.S. started. When did the birth rate in the U.S. start going down? Was it, was it post, post, six, post sexual revolution? Like the 60s. Yeah. 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 The pill, divorce. Yes, sir. Um, I suspect that about 98% of the people in Toronto are college educated. Uh, I can tell you when I see you. Um, but uh, those who have not gotten higher education, are they more or less discontent? than say they used to be 30 years ago. Are they happier perhaps because they don't have $100,000 worth of education loans to pay off? Um, are they finding satisfaction in doing useful things that benefit everybody in their community? And how, how are they doing? Well, just generally I believe that 
once one satisfies the basic needs, you know, just decent lodging, decent food, there is no correlation between happiness and, and money. So if, if there's no correlation between happiness at three hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars won't won't. There's no, no necessary correlation between that and producing more, more happiness. So I think that, that holds generally. What, what you mean by the college educated versus the uncollege educated, certainly uh, we see a lot of phenomena with the hollowing out of the middle class, right? The middle class in, in this country. And working class wages have been stagnant for, for how long? The 70s? for the, the economists in, in, in the room. Uh, and middle class life has gotten harder. You want your kids to go to college, look at the cost of college. You know, healthcare costs, right? And you, you, you see things are getting, getting more difficult for people outside, materially difficult for people outside the elite. And we have those deaths of despair, right? Deaths from despair, uh, as they're called that we see from, from working class whites, mostly, where we see the life expectancy is actually going down in this country. In reason because of the deaths of despair, because of alcoholism and drugs and suicide rates. So th those are signs. But you know, the funny thing that I see, again, I'm just speaking anecdotally, is the, uh, the elite in this country. They're not happy. I mean, they're, I, I tell you, that. I've never heard anyone express contempt for the lower orders, for the hoi polloi, like I've heard from my enlightened, caring, liberal professor colleagues. They despise the uncollege educated. And I'm amazed. They, 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 the deplorables, that remark by Hillary connected so much because the uncollege educated have heard this for decades. Every time they were, they were told, you gotta go to college if you're gonna be a success. I didn't go to college. I guess I'm not a success, I'm a loser. Right? When Donald Trump said, I think it was after Nevada, when they were making such a big thing about educated people don't vote, Donald Trump only appeals to stupid people. Trump, after Nevada, winning Nevada, he said, you remember this remark? I love poorly educated people. Okay. <laughs> he said. Now, that was his exact quote. Now, that comment, the elite, just fed into, ugh, ugh, what a boob, part of the idiot crowd. What they didn't realize is, this is the first time they heard a national politician say, I love you. I mean, no one said Barack Obama certainly never made the working class, you know, the, the, the lower middle class, uncollege educated, feel good about themselves. Never said anything, I like you. They knew. You know, I, I remember saying to a colleague, uh, uh, in 2008, why do all these professors love Obama so much? He said, because they think he's one of them. That's the definition. Is he one of us? Right? He's not. Donald Trump's not one of us. You know, Al Gore's one of us. So, uh, I think that the division. I mean, I, I can't really say about that. The happiness. Division, but we've got a social division between the elite and everyone else now. We've never, we haven't seen since the Gilded Age, right? But there's something again. There's something poisonous about it now uh, that that is, is, is just different. I think the elite. I mean, look that that wall that Biden has built around the White House. You know this new wall, solid white, ten foot wall on the interior of the, it was huge. That, that is, or, or I, I, was walking, I was walking up to Union Station the, the other day to catch a train. And around the Capitol, a lot of wire, a lot of guardhouses, 
lot of concrete barriers. Okay? This is the elite. We don't, we don't know what they're going to do. Okay? We got a convoy coming right? on DC. They're, they're very, very nervous. I think they're nervous because they know that they have been putting it to everyone and lining their own pockets very nicely there in DC. Uh, everyone does well. They, they walk around with entourages all the time. Uh, the, and the tent cities don't bother them. There's a tent city outside Union Station. There are tents along Pennsylvania Avenue now. That doesn't, the underclass doesn't bother them. It is, it is the working, working class and the lower, working lower middle class. They know that these people are a political problem and Donald Trump showed that this is, this is something we've got, we've got to find a way to, con to contend with this. So. Yes, sir. Looking for a way to get out of this toxicity. We talked about how it all got started back in the English departments. As you look across the country, do your research and study and all of that, do you see any hope for conservative, reform-minded university governance with college trustees? Or is it just going to go on and on like it's happened here in North Carolina where we thought we had a chance to reform, but blew it? Do you see any hope in well, the country for reform-minded, conservative <laughs> university governance reform? Here are some signs. Uh, you saw, I'm in Virginia, I live in Northern Virginia, and you saw the Virginia election a couple months ago. Virginia's blue because Northern Virginia suburbs are all Democrat. Now, there used to be, used to be military in Virginia. All the conservatives, the conservative DC people live in Virginia, the liberal people, when I, when I was at the Arts Endowment in uh, 03 to, to 05, it was all the conservatives lived in Virginia, liberals lived in Maryland. It's just one of them, the, the breakdown. Uh, but now, now with the federal government explosion and property was less expensive in Virginia, you, you've got a solid blue now. Amazon's headquarters is you know ten minutes from from my from my townhouse, so uh, that that'll make it worse. But you saw Republicans won the top three posts in Virginia: governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general. And Yunkin, I actually thought Yunkin was be, going to be another another disappointment. But he, in his first few weeks, he has taken it to the DEI bureaucracy. He's taken it to the school boards, and he's very strong. He's made a couple bad bad personnel decisions, but he's he's fixed those when he got when he got the criticism. Your question may be decided by what happens in November with the midterms. If the Democrats get handed a, a catastrophe, that's that I, I regard that as an optimistic sign. If these issues of school boards, I don't know if you've seen a lot of the news, the school boards in Virginia, big story, and they wanted to cast that as these conservative, right-wing, racist parents, a whole lot of those parents are liberals who were who were at the microphone yelling at the school board members. Some of them were black as well. And so if that keeps up, and, and, and it's still going on, just this week in Loudoun County, we, we had another episode in a school board meeting where the school board, these school board members, they come on like, you know, like Mel Brooks in, in uh, you know, History of the World. It's good to be the king. Just get out of here. You're little people. Hoy polloi, beat it. We're in charge here. That's the attitude that we're seeing. And so they're not backing off. They're doubling down. They're tripling down. I mean, New Jersey. If New Jersey had a halfway competent state Republican Party, New Jersey, Republicans would have won the governorship in New Jersey. They're so demoralized at the state level, I don't know about North Carolina, but the state level, Republicans in a lot of states, they, they, these states have been blue for so long that uh, 
they're not they're not seizing opportunities that are out there right now because this critical race theory stuff in schools is deeply unpopular. I mean, there's a tiny portion of people who approve of this stuff. I saw, I saw a video in a DC school kindergartners marching through the school with placards, black lives matter, black lives matter, white kids and black kids holding placards saying this. So have, you looked at, have you looked at test scores, reading and writing, and, and math in DC schools? This is what you're having them do? is hurting all kids here with this stuff. So we'll see. I, th I, think, I think this year it is, is going to be very, this year will be decisive with the midterm elections. And, and we see that the Democrats are panicking about it. We're, we're, They're going to do something. We'll get into a war. We'll have, we'll have more lockdown. Something to, to, to disrupt, I think. So, sorry. Yeah. No, no, yeah. But yeah, you follow up? Yes. I'm just going to say, say it is a, a red wave all over the country. And Republicans win like they've never won before. <coughs> How do you convince Republican leadership, Republican establishments in all the states to do something about the university governments? Uh, I think this is where things like this legislation, you know, the Stanley Kurtz, Martin Center of Legislation, and we need to tell people, look, we'll get rid of you. You're not our champion unless you do what we want you to do. If you go in office and, and do nothing but you know some, 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 some deregulation and tax reform and leave all the leftist social educational stuff in place, you're out. That, that's, what, that's what needs to happen. Because you know how many times right, have, have Republicans just, we just don't want to touch the education stuff. You know, in a lot of in a lot of red, super red states like South Dakota, there is an education bureaucracy in the governor's office made up of a bunch of kooky leftists, right under right under the nose of, of the governor and the, and the and the education secretary for the state. Wake up! If you don't change this education system, if you don't change this bureaucracy. The left wins the long, wins the war. You win a few battles, you win the war. I mean, they, they understand, you control the schools, you control the society, you know, 20, 20, 20 years out. That's why I mentioned, what happened in the English department in 1990 happens in the Democratic Party at the highest levels in 2020. So, uh, and, and, and producing this, you know, depriving the young of that humanities, Western civ education, is a way of preventing them from realizing okay, all, all of this. An ignorant population, an, an ignorant, un, great unwashed, we love that, right? we love that. One of the problems with, with Trump was he wakened the consciousness of a, a large swath of voters. Right? He woke them up to their own identity in a way, and they hate that, they hate it. So, Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna end our official program right now. Right now, but Mark will stick around to sign books. You can purchase books. Um, and I, as I said, we've got some Martin Center materials at the table as well. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, and like I said, stick around if you like. Otherwise, have a great afternoon.